Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Today, I'm joined by Daniel Dumbrell, a political commentator on China-related issues who's based in Shenzhen, China. We're going to be speaking about his experiences in China, everything from Hong Kong to Xinjiang, and how it relates to America's new Cold War. Daniel, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So I'm really excited to speak to you. And I guess the best way for us to start out here is, you know, can you give our listeners and viewers an idea of who you are? Tell us what you do and how you ended up with China and we can, or how you ended up in China and we can go yeah. from there. Yeah, sure. No problem. First of all, up front, I got to say, I'm a fan of your work. I've been following oh, you on Twitter you. since 2019. And uh, I really appreciate what you do. And, and hopefully later in the conversation, I can explain exactly why that is. But as for myself, uh, I've been in, in China since 2008. Um, I came here to do business, um, you know, doing this YouTube thing, this polit political commentation thing is not something I ever thought I would do. Um, and it, it kind of takes away from my main work that I do. But I got into it. And the reason I started was um, around the Hong Kong protest time period. Uh, when things were kind of unraveling there, I was just I was just blown away by how different the uh, truth on the ground was versus the narrative that was being broadcasted overseas. I had a lot of friends in Hong Kong. Um, they were kind of you could call them. They were superficially called pro-establishment. They didn't side with these protesters, but they wouldn't dare speak up because it was dangerous for them. If they spoke up, their businesses would be attacked and all of this kind of stuff. And it was really ironic. I had I had other Hong Kong friends um, who, when they came over to Shenzhen, the mainland side, they would uh, all of a sudden say, ah, finally, I'm free. I can say whatever I want, which is totally ironic because people thought you you can't do that in China. Yeah. So it was it was just so backwards for me. And it was just like these are people that are supposedly fighting for democracy, but they're burning down the political offices of their opponent. They stabbed a, 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 a pro-establishment politician. They set a man on fire. And these people were like there were there were actually people who were lifting up the protesters to say that they deserved a Nobel Peace Prize. And I said, you know what? I got to I got to say something. And I felt like it was seeing a lot of uh, because I mean the U.S. admitted that they had NED and all these different kinds of programs that were running in 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 Hong Kong. Uh, U, um, U.S. AGM had some uh, different programs they were running there as well. And one thing that was unfolding was that there was a huge um, divide happening between ho local Hong Kong people and mainland Chinese residents who either immigrated to Hong Kong before or they were Mandarin speakers. And there was a guy Jimmy Lai who was publishing things that were really that was really stoking that fire. Um, you know, previous publications were calling mainlanders, uh, mainland Chinese people, locusts and all this kind of stuff. And I felt like I was seeing something that I had always wondered about in the past. For example, my mother's country of Guyana in South America, they had a similar thing after Chetty Jagan was elected. He was a little bit too kind of socialist leaning. And all of a sudden, um, this is declassified documents. Uh, the MI5 and the CIA went in and they created uh, they stoked racial violence between the um, the people of African descent and the people of Indian descent and just, you know, launched the, the country into chaos. Eventually, uh, Chetty Jagan was replaced with somebody else. So I felt like that's what's happening now. And I got to say something. And so that's um, that's how I kind of got started. And then obviously Xinjiang became a lot more of a target. Um, so I really started digging into that a little bit more. I know people from Xinjiang and everything like that. And I went to visit, which we can get into a bit later. But that was kind of um, the evolution of what um, what got me into it. There's a few other reasons, but that's kind of the the, the general version. Well, it's, it's, it's always interesting. I mean, you were in China and you're there to see how the U.S. media is portraying everything versus the reality from people who actually live in these places. So let's start with Hong Kong. Um, you, you kind of gave a little brief view of what the protests in Hong Kong were like. But, you know, in the U.S., Hong Kong is portrayed as, you know, as you know, very black and white. It's this place that China is imposing itself on. Right. Um, so what is the reality there like what happened in hong kong how did it start because that's another thing that's so fascinating about hong kong is the way that the security law came about that everybody started protesting about so like what was the inception of what triggered protests in hong kong which were obviously receiving support and funding as well from various u.s regime change organizations but yeah right. can you give our, yeah. our viewers and listeners like a brief overview of the hong kong issue how did it start so, I mean, one of the main catalysts were um, was the kind of extradition bill. You know, there was a, a Hong Kong man who murdered his girlfriend in Taiwan, um, 
cut her up, put her in a suitcase and dumped her somewhere and came back to Hong Kong. And there was no extradition bill to send him over to Taiwan. So they said, we need to fix this because there's a murderer on the loose in Hong Kong. Well, initially, he wasn't on the loose. He they managed to get him on something superficial regarding um, uh, money laundering or something along the lines of that, because when he came back, he was using his girlfriend, uh, his girlfriend's uh, bank card. So he was in prison for a very short period of time, but he was going to be released soon. And they're like, we need to find a way to get this guy back. So they were going to put this extradition bill in place. But the problem is they couldn't launch it for only Taiwan. Um, you know, they couldn't say that, you know, recognize Taiwan as an individual place. They say, OK, let's do this across the board. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, mainland China is going to have the ability to extradite people from Hong Kong as well. The rules behind it were really strict. It was never, ever represented accurately. I interacted with some of the people from BBC who are in charge of reporting on this. And I said, hold on a second here. You have actual fabrications in your report. And I just got blocked by them. They're like, we did, they didn't want to engage. Yeah. Uh, Stephen McDonald, he said he was the main guy for the extradition bill. And he said, point to me the inaccuracies. And I said, OK, send me a report. Send, send me your you know, uh, reporting or BBC's reporting on the extradition bill. So he waited a few days and then he sent me an article that was changed. It was modified like a few minutes before he sent it to me. So I think he, they were trying to cross all their T's, dot all their I's. And they sent it to me and there were still inaccuracies in it. And I said, well, here we go. One, two, three, four. This is where it's inaccurate. So people didn't realize that it was a really uh, robust thing where it had to be a crime both in mainland China and in Hong Kong. It had to go through the whole judicial system. The final approval was in the um, uh, the chief executive's hands. She could make the final approval for an extradition to China, but she couldn't um, force it. Like, for example, the court said, no, 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 this person's not going to be extradited. The, the chief executive couldn't override that and say, no, you're being sent to Hong Kong. So there was a lot of misrepresentation around the um, extradition bill, which was something that was really, really needed. Um, Taiwan, um, I think, you know, the forces that were involved in Taiwan really took advantage of this also. And they were pretending that, no, no, we're not going to accept this guy under an extradition bill like this anyways. Um, you know, even though he chopped up his girlfriend, like that's so, so insane to get the guy chopped up his girlfriend. Oh, it girlfriend. gets worse. It gets worse. So while he was in prison, um, there was a um, there was somebody, a counselor who went in and convinced him that when he was going to be released from prison, he would turn himself in. He would fly to Taiwan and turn himself in. And he agreed. He said, OK, we're going to do it. And after that was announced, Taiwan said, no, we're not going to allow him to fly back. So it's <laughs> like, OK, hold on a second. What, what is this really about? And then they made up this new kind of a thing saying you have to allow Taiwan police officers to fly to Hong Kong and make the arrest in Hong Kong. So they basically designed a, a, a system that would a situation that would never actually happen. Like, yeah. you know, China is not going to give Taiwanese police officers authority in Hong Kong to make arrests. Right. It was deliberately designed around that. So that was the the catalyst. But after they canceled the extradition bill, it kept going forward. It kept becoming about these other demands, giving mm -hmm. amnesty to all of these rioters and all of these things. So it was constantly moving the goalposts to keep this going. That was the whole uh, thing that they wanted to do. Um, so it just kind of descended into chaos. And I think that was the main goal. I, one thing I do want to say, though, is underneath it all, there are issues in Hong Kong. There are issues with housing affordability, with the way that the uh, the system works there. Um, in terms of the economics and things like that, you know, the apartments are really small. So a lot of the times when these things happen, there are other underlying societal issues, uh, but they use another excuse to bring it out. And obviously outside forces capitalize on that as well. Um, but that's kind of how it, 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 uh, it, it spiraled out of control initially anyways. It's such a typical story. I mean, everywhere you look, of course, countries and territories, I guess, in the case of Hong Kong, they have lots of issues locally, like any place. I mean, the U.S. has lots of issues. And what these organizations like, you know, National Endowment for Democracy and USAID do so well, and I've seen them do it in the Middle East, I'm, you know, you've seen them do it in China, um, is they latch on to genuine grievances um, right. and push, you know, and then also they encourage like destructive rioting. I mean, that's one thing I think mm -hmm. Americans don't understand is the level of destructive rioting that our, our U.S. organizations end up supporting, whether it's like, you know, in the case of a place like Syria, which has way bigger problems than a place like Hong Kong in terms of, you know, economics and freedom and all kinds of repression. Um, and they have a lot more to protest there. But 
the backing ends up going to people who are like burning down police stations and right. who are like lynching people in the street and who are right wing and xenophobic and sec and sectarian in the case of Syria and racist. And that's like what people don't seem to understand is these are really like the proud boys <laughs> or right. some other. Yeah. Well it's interesting you should make that comparison as well, because the, the one thing I constantly say as well is while these riots were going on, you had people like uh, Josh Hawley and uh, some other senators, Ted Cruz, flying over to Hong Kong to right. cheer on these protesters. All you have to do is you have to imagine if during the Capitol Hill riots, if there were uh, Chinese Communist Party officials flying over to, from Beijing to cheer them on. <laughs> What what do you think would happen? That would be absolutely unacceptable. And in terms of saying that Syria or all these other places have more problems, that's also a good point. According to measurable, tangible freedoms by the Cato Institute, Hong Kong was ranked the third freest place on Earth. This mm -hmm. is by uh, freedom of movement, taxation, size of government, uh, 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 freedom of religion, freedom of press. All of these things wrapped up together. Hong Kong was number three, the third freest place on Earth. The U.S. was, I think it was the 17th or something like that. So the 17th place is coming to bring freedom to Hong Kong, the third freest place on Earth, <laughs> according to measurable freedoms. And the Cato Institute is not a pro-China report. They put all these, no. ca ca you know, th these, uh, you know, fine print underneath saying, but, you know, the Chinese government's really evil and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, when you're using math and you're, you, you, you've got to actually put your data out there. Hong Kong was a very considered a very very free place, even according to Western standards. So China yeah. China ranks lo low on the list. But if you want to use, because that's what they're using, they're using a, a Western lens on Hong Kong, using their own set of standards. Hong Kong was a very free place, and this is what they were doing to it. Yeah, and you know now it seems as though China actually won when it comes to what happened in Hong Kong. Like the U.S. failed in its attempt to. You know, it succeeded in, in, of course, causing a lot of destruction to the economy because um, those those riots persisted for several months. I think maybe even more than a year that was ongoing. Oh, it was over. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it devastated the economy and tourism. Um, but ultimately, the U.S. failed. And now it, I don't know, is, is, is this still an ongoing issue in Hong Kong or is it kind of like firmly been decided not uh, really. I mean, okay. you know, there's all kinds of new laws that were put in place. The national security law was something that was supposed to be launched anyways. Um, but that basically um, what unraveled helped push this forward sooner. I mean, you had people like uh, the National Front leader, uh, Baguio Liang. He was on uh, live streams with um, with uh, Guo Wenwei, who was also with uh, Steve Bannon. And Guo Wenwei was promising him, saying, we will give you all the support you need. You have Steve Bannon's full support. You have the U.S. government's full support. Don't worry. And then, like, I think it was a month or two months after that, he was arrested in connection with one of the largest explosive halls in Hong Kong's history. Wow. For some reason, he managed to get bail. I don't know how how that happened. Um, one of my friends in Hong Kong said there's a lot of corrupt drug, dr uh, uh, not drug, sorry, uh, judges <laughs> from the colonial colonial era. Um, who probably said, okay, you can have Bell. And now he's in the US. And he went to that recent summit um, in Washington, D.C. that had Anthony Blinken, um, all these different people kind of in this China bashing session. And he was there at, at one of the breakout sessions explaining how you know terrible Hong Kong was and everything like that. So when you have that kind of a situation and you have senators from the U.S. who can fly over and do all this kind of stuff, there needs to be some controls in place. Every other society has national security law. Um, of course, there's always a risk that a society or government will overuse those laws or that they will you know, use them to... Uh, oppress people with there. There's always that risk. But unfortunately, it's like, what what do you do here? And it, it even got in a situation where ordinary people in Hong Kong who were really not interested in politics at all start, suddenly started cheering for the national security bill. Like I have friends in Hong Kong who were opening up bottles of champagne when it passed. You know, these are stories you're not going to see in the West. Now, of course, there are other people who completely hate it and they were part of the protest. They were part of the protesters. They were kind of brainwashed into believing that this is what they need to do. Um, but the other side of the story, which is still a very significant uh, number of people involved in it, that story didn't get told by the West. And so I felt I felt frustrated by it. And that goes back into why I was like, OK, people need to hear the other side of the story. People, people might not believe me, but I'm going to I'm going to put it out there. And I had people because I lived in Hong Kong for two years as well um, wow. in the middle kind of uh, of the uh, of my time over here. And um, some of my 
son's classmates, friends from the school he used to go to, when they saw some of my videos, they hadn't contacted me in years. They sent me messages thanking me for putting these out, saying thank you for telling this side of the story because we can't do it. If we did it, our businesses would be attacked. It would just be too dangerous for us. We have our families here. I mean, I think it was pretty revealing when you saw images of protesters like storming into, I think it was like the parliament putting up the British flag. Hong Kong used to be like occupied by the British and controlled by the British. Yeah, the legislative council, yeah. And uh, of course, you know, waving Trump flags and and all of these things. And I thought it was so interesting. Recently, there was this uh, freak out in the Western mainstream press about a guy who had been sentenced under this new security law to like nine years in prison. And they made it sound like this guy was just a protester. But when you actually read the article about why he was sentenced to nine years in prison in Hong Kong, it was because he intentionally ran his motorcycle into a group of police officers trying to kill them. I mean, yeah. it's, like it's just in the U.S., you know, if somebody were to run a vehicle into police officers, I don't even think they'd make it out alive. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, exactly. I, I remember seeing that video. Like when that happened, I remember seeing that video. Like I was watching all of this stuff as it was, as it was happening. And people don't know this. When you get ordinary people who have been propagandized into the U.S.'s view of the, the situation in Hong Kong, they don't know that protesters lit a man on fire and he went into, you know, uh, critical uh, he went into critical care for many, many months. He has permanent nerve damage all over his body. People don't know this. They don't know that side of the story. So it's really remarkable how people control uh, the narrative. And then so obviously the next target was um, uh, is, is Xinjiang more so now. They know they failed in Hong Kong. Um, they've left Hong Kong for all of those protesters who were standing with Trump flags and U.S. flags. Mm -hmm. They're left in a situation worse off than they were before because now they have these national security laws that they don't really like and things like that. And there probably would have been a chance for it to be pushed out much further um, had this not happened. Um, and the U.S. doesn't really care anymore. I mean, they might make some superficial efforts and bring some people over, especially if they're willing to tell a, 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 a good story, which is happening in Xinjiang. And I'll mention one of those stories in a bit. But for the most part, they're they're done. They've been used. Next, you know, you know Xinjiang. It's, uh, it's um, and I want to get to Xinjiang, but first, I think that that's a really good segue into the issue of America really just like abandons abandons its its tools, its puppets, its allies, its friends, as we just saw in Afghanistan. Right, the U.S. spent right. twenty years propping up this government in Afghanistan only to then hand the country over to the Taliban and allow that government to fall. It kind of like almost allowed a coup against the government it backed. Uh, and the reason I mentioned Afghanistan is, you know, before we get into the issue in Xinjiang, this is, this is tangentially related, is, you know, um, a lot of attention. It, it, like I, I was actually first curious, is there a lot of attention in China being given to events in Afghanistan? And what does the Afghan defeat uh for the Afghan government look like from there, especially given that Afghanistan is close to China, like geographically close to China. Uh, is there a conversation in China about how this might impact the country's national security? I saw that the Chinese government is of course concerned about the Taliban potentially giving a safe haven to the Turkestan Islamic party, which is the Uyghur jihadist mm -hmm. separatist group thousands of whom uh, actually went and fought in Syria and still live in, in Idlib till this day. Right. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, people are talking about it on the ground a little bit. It's not really huge, uh, huge news here from what I see. I don't really consume too much media here. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I'm not really a big fan of, uh, of, of Chinese state media. <laughs> they don't really know. How, first of all, they don't know how to tell their stories well, but also they just kind of say it like it is like actually Chinese state media is pretty reliable when it comes to international news. But the whole reason I got into really analyzing news is because it fascinates me when people put things out that are just so far from the truth. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you can see things going on like um, China willing to engage with the Taliban and things like that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think there's, you know, everybody, everybody seems to be an, an expert on Afghanistan at the moment. But <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I don't think we know how it's going to play out. I mean, I have right. mixed feelings about what China's, uh, how China engages the world in this situation. The Taliban are in control of Afghanistan right now. China's philosophy on foreign policy is they don't interfere in foreign governments like they do with the U like the U.S. does. If the U.S. doesn't like right. a government, or they're not playing ball with their corporate interests, they overthrow them 
or they, you know, sponsor a military coup. China won't do that. They'll just say, okay, well, the Taliban are in charge now. So this is who we deal with. This is who we negotiate right. with. So on one, on one hand, you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean China is actually legitimizing these guys? But on the other hand, this is the thing that we like about China is that they just, you know, they, they don't interfere in the politics of other people's countries. So um, that that's, I don't think that conversation is happening in the media, but that's just how I'm processing all of this as it's happening. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think they definitely want to make sure that they're no longer aligned with uh, ETIM or TIP uh, uh, as they've been, you know, many of them have rebranded them to. Uh, but, you know, they, they've already they already have an alliance with the Taliban, whether the Taliban kind of breaks off with them or not um, is 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 yet to be seen. But I think I think definitely. Probably whether that's in the conversation of the media here or not, I, I'm sure that's a, a major concern for the Chinese government. So I guess it's a good time to turn to the issue that everybody honestly wants to hear about, learn about, understand more about because there's so pro much propaganda around it, which is the issue of Xinjiang. But first, I, I have to ask you because of all the criticism that this issue comes with. Um, and I know that you get relentlessly attacked a, a lot for for just you know being honest from how you see it on this issue. But Everyone talks about China as being this very uh, repressive place to speak openly about anything. So I'm curious, before we go into Xinjiang, have you ever been harassed or had trouble with security authorities in China? Never. Never okay. once in my life. <laughs> All right. I That's mean, interesting. You know, yeah. Maybe there was a parking lot or something like that where, you know, they, they wanted to rip me off or something. And the security guard was trying to get like two parking space fees for me or something like that. But in terms of government, actual security forces, no, <laughs> I've never, ever had an issue. If anything, they're really friendly when you when you run into um, kind of police or things like that in different parts of China. They're very, very friendly with foreigners. Yeah. Um, OK. You know, it, maybe they know one or two words in English and they'll say to you like, hello, in a very em emphasized kind of uh, trying to do like an English accent when they say say hello um but very very friendly you know i was when i was in xinjiang and i was going around i kept that in mind because you know you see these journalists going there and they do all these dramatic things like they're saying oh there's security i'm gonna duck down and they duck down in their cars and they make it really dramatic and, and they have scary I, music yeah yeah exactly <laughs> they, they do the scary music and when i went to some of these like places like I, I i visited some of the coordinates that people were talking about and stuff like that and some places you can't go in like there were there was one place that was under construction and there was a female uyghur she must have been in her 40s or 50s or something like that she says no 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 you can't go in here and i was thinking as i was doing all this i said how would i make this into an issue if i was from the bbc you know, I would say, OK, well, first of all, maybe I would find a different entrance with maybe some male security guards because she doesn't look very intimidating. And I would try to push my way into this private property and create a confrontation. I was kind of looking at that because I, I, I mean, I wasn't experiencing any of that anywhere in China. And it's remarkable to me that these journalists can continually over and over again find these conflicts. Um, <laughs> but but, you know, me personally, no, I, I haven't uh, experienced anything like that. And so you, of course, you recently visited Xinjiang, and I guess a good place to start before we talk about some of what you witnessed is, can you like situate, th this is part of a broader, first of all, people need to understand this is part of a broader uh, attack on China by sort of using these different geographical regions that have uh, distinct minority groups and, you know, cultural groups, ethnicities, uh, territories, whether it's Hong Kong or Xinjiang or Tibet or Taiwan. Uh, and this is what we've heard the State Department and CIA openly admit is they want to foment unrest in these different areas uh, that, that where they can cultivate it in an effort to balkanize China and break it up and essentially make it weaker because China has this massive economy that's supposed to overtake uh, the U.S. economy by like 2025 or something. I don't know, some year that they've decided that they need to like hurry up and, you know, destroy China before that happens. But so you recently visited Xinjiang, where we hear there's this massive genocide taking place, this massive, uh, you know, some people use really, I think, sensationist language, like they call it a holocaust. They they say that millions of, of Uyghurs are being rounded up and put into camps. So I guess I want to address that, but let's talk about, before we talk about that, I guess, how did you get there? Was it difficult to go there? Did you need permission? And is there a lot of security there? Because like you were talking about in a lot of these videos that you see, whether it's from Vice or CNN, like they make it sound like they have to sneak in or there's just security guards everywhere and they're constantly having to hide. They're constantly being followed. There's constantly scary music. So what was your experience in that respect? 
So, yeah, I guess before we get into the whole kind of what is actually going on in terms of visiting. Uh, so T Tibet is a place where there's more restrictions in place. You need to apply for special mm -hmm. permits and things like that. I I've been to Tibet twice. Um, but Xinjiang, not at all. You can just go there whenever you want. There might be some restrictions sometimes because of the COVID situation, but you just go there. I, I you know, I booked my own flight. Uh, I was in mm -hmm. Shanghai for a conference and I flew from Shanghai directly uh, through uh, from Urumqi to Ka um, uh, Kashgar. Uh, Kashgar is a city that has a little bit more local kind of culture. So that's where I wanted to go to experience things. And I went by myself. Now, halfway through the trip, I really wanted to visit some of these places that people were talking about, like these different coordinates and talk to somebody. So I did reach out to some contacts to find out if I could get extra permission to go places. So the first half of my trip was just me exploring by myself. I was going into markets. I was talking to ordinary people. I was asking them about the situation. Um, you know, they had all kinds of restrictions in place when the terrorism was going on. And some of them might seem strange to people, you know, for example, in the in the in the uh, restaurants and the butcher shops there, the ch uh, the knives were chained down to their table. So nobody could grab a knife and kind of attack somebody with a knife. And so I noticed when I was there um, that the guy, you know, I, at the barbecue shop I was at, he had the knife. It was attached to a chain, but the chain wasn't attached to the table. So I was asking about that. I was saying, you know, is that was that because of the you know terrorism issue? He said, yeah, I said, but it seems like it's like loosened up a lot now he says yeah it's not it's not as bad anymore um you can go there you can talk to people by yourself um and it's it's no problem very easy now if you're a, specifically a journalist and you're you're going to do journalism i'm not sure the process is any different but for regular uh, even for vloggers i know a lot of other people who went there and filmed they didn't get any permission they didn't tell anybody and they went and they filmed for a week or two weeks and they came back anybody can do it um, so it really, it really is, uh, quite easy. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've gotten past that part, <laughs> uh, can you tell, can you describe what you saw in Xinjiang and how did it, uh, compare to the kinds of uh, accusations that we're hearing in the U S press? So, I mean, everything, you know, kids in the street, uh, who were playing, they were speaking their local language. That was something I was paying attention to because obviously you hear about, their language being eradicated. Um, I visited the mosque. Um, you know, people were attending the mosque at night. Uh, I think there were, if I remember correctly, there were more people on Friday, mostly old people. I had the chance to speak to one of the imams at Idkar Mosque. His father was actually uh, one of the people who was killed by these terrorists. And a lot of people don't realize that. There were a lot of Uyghurs who were targeted by these terrorists because this wasn't really necessarily about these um uh, Salafist jihadists against China. It was Salafist jihadists against infidels, people who wouldn't follow this extreme interpretation of Islam. So in many ways, Uyghurs were an even bigger target uh, for them. So I got to meet this guy and I asked him about it. I asked him about the volumes of people to the mosque. And he said, it is down a lot. And I was asking him, as I said, is that are there any programs in place to try to um, uh, discourage people from going. He said, no, he says, this is just a natural phenomenon all around the world. He said, when your society improves and people get better jobs and stuff like that, they come less often. He said, but during the holidays, a lot of people come. So what I witnessed uh, was mostly old people, a lot of old people going to the mosque uh, in the evenings. Um, police presence, for sure. There's a very, very big uh, police presence. They seem to be very integrated in society. They're they're very friendly with everybody. Um, when they see, you know, I saw a police officer pushing somebody in a wheelchair across the road. When I was speaking to one of my Uyghur friends there, she was saying the police are so integrated in society that people call them for everything. She says, like, somebody in her building had a water pipe break, and they called the police. And the police <laughs> came, and they're like, oh, okay. And they helped, like, fix the pipe and stuff like that. And she said, because she's not really a very religious, a lot of Uyghurs are kind of moderate Muslims, or they've adopted a lot of the um, uh, Islamic practices as a matter of culture more than it is a strict kind of religious following. Mm -hmm. And so she, there were a lot of the restaurants that I went to, um, because it was during their kind of religious holiday, there weren't people eating in the day, they were fasting. But she was somebody who, do who doesn't follow that, and she eats. And she said before, when these forces were loose in uh, Xinjiang, she would be afraid to go out and kind of, you know, eat during these time periods. Or Uyghurs who drink, they would be afraid to be seen drinking in public, even though uh, the culture of winemaking in Uyghur culture predates even that of Islam in the Uyghur community. But th these were things that were would put them at great risk from these kinds of terrorists. And it's really interesting. So these terrorists wanted to erase these parts of Uyghur culture. They wanted um, women to wear um, 
uh, uh, niqabs and all of these things that aren't part of Uyghur culture, that's when the real cultural genocide was going on. That was the actual cultural genocide. And nobody cared about it then. And so when China came in and said, OK, fine, we've got to do something about this, um, they put all these different things in place. And sometimes it was clumsy. Sometimes it was clumsy. Like they had these different rules that when you look at it on paper, it's like, why would you why would you do this? What What is this law about? So, for example, they say that, you know, a re really clumsily worded. I don't know exactly how they worded it, but it was something along the lines of you can't stop consuming media, which people translate to state media because most media in China is state media. But they don't explain that what, the specific thing they were trying to counter is that the way these groups were trying to radicalize these people were withdrawing them from society. They were telling women mm -hmm. that women can't go out, that you have to stop listening to everybody else. You have to uh, listen to these uh, Salafist jihadist ideologies. So that was their way of trying to counter it, which is a very clumsy way of doing it. So there were uh, missteps along the way, but they really created a, a pretty effective program. But it's interesting to see how everybody's processing this, because now everybody's talking about, for example, oh, wow, this um, extreme version of Islam is going to take over Afghanistan now that the Taliban are in place. So all of a sudden, people have an appreciation for what huh. that specific interpretation of, uh, of, of Islam might do to especially women and children in that society but they didn't care that that's exactly what was happening in in xinjiang all of a sudden they care about women and children living under sharia law all of a sudden they care on, a, on an additional they care about women and children in afghanistan that u.s soldiers were killing and bombing and drone striking now they're going to say how are the taliban going to treat women and children hopefully better than you did. But, you know, obviously there's a there's an issue going on here. And these things don't happen in a bubble. Also, if you look at Kyrgyzstan in the south of mostly Uzbek um, ethnic minorities, they were the group that was targeted for uh, radicalization. So it has the same kind of a thing. They, they want to establish mm. a caliphate and rule over their region with uh, a Sharia law. These things are real. But I think the problem we have is that the word uh, war on terror has been so tainted by the U.S. Um, that people have a hard time looking at it as a legitimate thing. Like when the U S talks about a war on terror, they're fighting terrorists that they created. You yes. know, if they're talking about war on terror. They're yeah. killing some terrorists and aligning with others who have an overlapping of a common enemy until they're, you know, finished using them. So it creates this situation where it's really hard for us in the West to imagine a war on terror as a legitimate thing. So I think I've been going on. For, I went a little bit off topic. No, no, there, no, I, I, no, not at all. Because so much of what you're saying actually is so similar to the situation in the Middle East. I mean, when you talk about the way that Salafi jihadism is the cultural genocide, I mean, I, it, I've seen it in Lebanon. I've seen it in Syria. I've seen it in Iraq. Um, and those are just the parts of the region that I'm familiar with and spend time in where the situation in even certain cities changed over the course of a few years because of investment in Salafi jihadi mosques or in Salafi mosques that ultimately do erase the local traditional culture and really drastically change society in an extremely regressive uh, negative way. And the other thing I wanted to comment on too is, you know, you mentioned uh, how the war on terror with the U.S. versus some people might have legitimate issues that can be considered like a real war on terror. What's what's so ironic is and hypocritical is that the U.S. and Americans in general have been inculcated to feel that it's their right to fight this war on terror on the other side of the world when there's people that they call terrorists who exist nowhere near them. I mean, no, like the U.S. Right. is is pretty, uh, you know, safe. Uh, and has like these natural, you know, borders of the ocean uh, that protect it from the areas of the world where these groups exist. Whereas with countries like Syria, with Lebanon, with China, it's it, it's inside their country. Like there actually is a threat, a legitimate, very real, very violent threat. And they're trying to find a way to deal with it. That doesn't mean the way they're dealing with it is perfect. But I, I think that because of the last 20 years of disastrous U.S. war on terror, a lot of American progressives and leftists 
you know, they've learned to understand the Bush war on terror rhetoric as very mm -hmm. wrong, right? We, we don't support this. So they end up projecting that onto other countries where it's, it doesn't necessarily fall under the same paradigm. And so I'm just, I'm just adding to what you were saying, I guess there, right. but I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how did you communicate with people? Do you speak any local languages? I speak Mandarin Chinese, so I, I can I usually speak to people there in Mandarin Chinese. A lot, some of the older Uyghurs there, they don't really speak Mandarin that well. Um, they only speak um, in their local dialect. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I speak in Chinese. I want to pick up on a few of the things that you mm, said as ahead. well. You know, um, that that's a really important people for un, to, for uh, for people to understand as well. Is these are countries that are dealing with a terrorism issue in their own countries. They're not going into some other country and saying we're going to fix this. This is something that they're doing that's within their rights of their own borders, and then. What they're doing also is they're not drone striking weddings. They're not carpet bombing towns. They're not picking up people and putting them in Guantanamo Bay and waterboarding them. They're not humiliating them in places like Abu Ghraib. They put training centers in place, vocational training centers. They had de-radicalization programs, skills training. They built infrastructure. They did all of this stuff. The real hardened kind of criminals, they just went to prison directly. Obviously, there are people who just were beyond uh, any repair, but there were different uh, circumstances that would get people put into these vocational training centers. If they were uh, caught plotting an attack um, or it was some sort of a minor attack, not on people, on a building. If there were people who were serving a prison sentence for some sort of uh, uh, terrorism issue and they were coming towards the end of their, ter uh, their sentence, they would be put through these programs to be reintroduced into society. Or if they were caught with extremist material, uh, terrorist material on their phones and stuff like that. And if you look at, for example, in England, I think it was last month or two months ago, there was an ex-police officer who was caught with Nazi, uh, a banned Nazi group material on his phone. He went to prison. There's no de-radicalization mm -hmm. program. But here they said, OK, you're caught with this stuff. You've got to go through these programs. They go home on the weekends. They can uh, take leave whenever they want. I spoke with somebody who went through one of these programs as well. And that is a pretty humanistic way of dealing with things. Even with that said, I think there probably were some program problems with the programs. I, I would imagine personally, I don't have any evidence for this, but I would imagine now the numbers, there's nothing to support the numbers of the millions that they were talking about. If I was take it, to take a guess, I would say tens of thousands, hundred thousand at most. If you consider that there's 10,000 uh, radicalized Uyghurs in Idlib fighting with you know ISIS and Al-Qaeda, a hundred thousand people who needed to go through uh, uh, um, a training in in, Ch in China seems like a reasonable number, which is also I want to note because these radicalized people were going to Syria and fighting a common enemy, Assad, people like to turn a blind eye to it. If these mm -hmm. terrorists were leaving China and they were attacking the West, they were killing your the people's family in the West. They were attacking uh, uh, the U.S. allies. All of a sudden, they wouldn't be underplaying China's terrorism issue. All of a sudden, yeah. even if all the accusations about China's concentration camps, you know, so-called concentration camps were true, it wouldn't matter. That would be nope. now downplayed and China would be painted as a country that's an exporter of terrorism that's, you know, wreaking havoc on the world. All of a sudden it would change because the U.S. has covered up much bigger atrocities than that. You can look at East Timor. How much do they care about the people in East Timor mm -hmm. and all of these places? So um, that was kind of the program that happened. Um, and this was, I mean, the people, there, 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 there are people in Xinjiang, Uyghurs, uh, Mongols, the uh, Kazakhs, all of these people, they are really grateful that this was controlled at this point, you know, at that point. Um, and when I put my video out, I put a video out where I kind of semi-criticized China. I was talking, I was saying, these are the things that make me uncomfortable about uh, their program, where I think... I guess that probably some people were caught up and sent to these pro pro uh, training programs who probably didn't deserve to be there. I had a lot of Muslim followers who reached out to me after that from Egypt, from uh, Pakistan, from all these places. And they actually criticized me. They said, I'm when I do that. <laughs> yeah, they, they said, when I do that. Uh, my viewpoint is coming from a privileged society. I grew up in Canada. They said, you don't understand how this Salafist jihadism spreads. You don't understand the true danger of it. You don't understand that we wish we had programs like this in Iraq, for example, when terrorism mm -hmm. was ripping through our country. Um, and, and so that was a really interesting perspective kind of uh, 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 changer for me also. But yeah, I mean, you gotta, gotta take a, t a step back and, and pay attention to the entire situation. Yeah. And uh, just real quick, I don't think we really uh, covered it. Can you just give a very brief background on what the terrorism problem in Xinjiang was that they were dealing with? There was uh, years there was like there was several years of actual 
terrorist attacks carried out by uh, the group whose name I'm now blanking on. But go ahead. Yeah, e ETIM. China still calls it by ETIM. Um, you know, they've uh, rebranded or the, a lot of people say, no, it's TIP, but whatever. There's no discernible difference between the two, really. And um, so they were carrying out uh, terrorist attacks in China. They wanted to separate out Xinjiang. If you actually speak to some of these terrorists, and I have spoken to some of them, and it's pretty scary what they want to do. Like they want to take over Xinjiang and they want to they want to ethnically cleanse Xinjiang. They say that all non-Turkic ethnic minorities, so non-Kazakhs, Kurzaks, Uyghurs, they would be expelled from Xinjiang, and even if they needed to be expelled by force. So you're talking about Mongols as well. And I, I specifically asked that. I said Mongols as well. They said, yeah, well, it would be up to the Uyghur authority. Mongols have been living in Xinjiang, especially north of the Tianxia Mountains, for longer than even the Uyghurs have. You know, Xinjiang has been a multi-ethnic society for you know over a century. Um, and what these people want to do is they want to create a, a, an ethno kind of a state ruled by uh, ruled by uh, Sharia law. So there were over a thousand terrorist attacks. There were about eight hundred people who were killed. Um, and eventually, China said, "No, we we really got to do something about this." Um, so that's when they came in with all these programs, for sure, mass surveillance, huge police presence and all that stuff. I mean, it's not you can't get rid of this stuff in a, in a, in a, in a pretty way, but still uh, what I would consider a, more, a far more humanistic approach. One thing to keep in mind, too, is that some people, some of them, they only had the goal to uh, leave China and, you know, uh, carry out a jihad somewhere else with other groups. And that's where you see them mm -hmm. going to Syria. They they go down, they escape through to Southeast Asia, they go to Malaysia, they go to the Turkish embassy, they get fake Turkish passports, they fly over to Turkey, and they're shuttled over to, um, they're shuttled over to uh, Syria. And when I was talking to people, there's one there's one journalist called Alison Killing. She just won a Pulitzer Prize because she re, re reversed engineered uh, a, a, an article and a program to say that China could hold a million people if they wanted to. Like it was kind of reverse engineering this to say okay, this to. is a possible <laughs> scenario. And that's what you know. One of my friends says like the whole the whole narrative on Xinjiang is this a sharpshooter fallacy where you know you have the bullet hole and then you paint the you paint the. Uh, uh, the target around it and you make it seem like yes that's exactly what's going on here that was really deliberate but yeah so when i asked her i said because she said etim there's not little evidence that etim exists so when i showed her videos of etim children training in camps that were built by isis when i showed her u.s generals admitting to doing airstrikes on etim in 2018 when I showed her all this, I said, well, what what do you think is going on here? And how do you explain all the Uyghurs fighting in uh, Syria? And she said, well, you know, they only went to Syria because they weren't able to stay in Turkey. And that's and, not and even so, a little bit true. <laughs> no, it's not. It, it's not like these, they're apologists. They're whitewashing it. But obviously it, it, it creates an obvious question. If everybody's so sure that the Uyghurs are being persecuted like this, and you have Uyghurs who are stuck in Turkey, who only have two choices, one is to go back to China and uh, face apparent uh, persecution, or go to Syria and have their children trained by terrorists and go around beheading people in the streets with uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, why aren't you opening up your countries to them? Why aren't you taking right. them as refugees? Try it. Try asking your politicians friend. to take them. Absolutely. They know. They know what China is saying is true. If they're that far, if they're there, they know that these are radicalized people. They know that they're going to go over to Syria and cause chaos there and fight against a common enemy. So like I said, it's like have at it. Once in a while, they'll do some airstrikes and some superficial kind of attacks against them. But more or less, these are people that are helping them and may eventually go back to attack China afterwards or at bare minimum Belt and Road Initiative projects all around uh, the world. And when you saw the U.S. suddenly delist ETIM as a terrorist organization off of the terrorist list, um, was it earlier this year or, or late last year? That was a clear sign that they were giving this group their blessing. When yeah. you're removed from the terrorist list, all of a sudden people can donate money to them. They can raise funds in U.S. dollars. They can try to say this isn't really a problem when it's really a huge problem for China. You've seen it in the last Cold War. You know, they, they were they they obviously worked with the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. This is a playbook they continually reuse over and over again. And they don't want they don't want those Uyghurs who got that far to Turkey to be their problem. They know what happened last time when they used Western passport holding Salafist jihadists to fight in Libya against Gaddafi. They came home and they did the Manchester bombing. They did all of these yep. things. They don't want they don't they don't want them to be their problem. They know that, okay, 
These are these are allies that we're going to keep at arm's length. So the people in power, they know what's going on. They know this is a legitimate threat. If you don't believe me, go and lobby your government to pick up those Uyghurs from Turkey and see what happens, because the people in real power know that that's not going to happen. Once in a while, you'll get somebody like Tursun Ziyawadan, who was a, um, uh, a Uyghur who was in Turkey, who had a story. In the beginning, her story wasn't that interesting. She said she didn't really experience any abuse. It was more psychological, but it was pretty good. She had her cell phone. They had meals in the canteen. And nobody really paid attention to her. That was her BuzzFeed interview in the beginning of 2020. Then later on, she upgraded her story to say that she was raped and tortured and she saw people killed and all this kind of stuff. Then she got front page coverage on CNN, on BBC, and she got ferried over to the U.S. where she's now doing the Niyira circuit, going on all these different you know, government uh, uh, sponsored panels to talk about the horrors that she saw. Um, and her story just falls apart when you actually look at it. Her passport was renewed during the time that she said she was under arrest. It's impossible. You have to go in, in person to renew your passport. Is this, I'm sorry, is it, was, was, did this person write a piece or was interviewed for a piece in the New Yorker? I saw something that something that sounds vaguely familiar, or I read something That's vaguely familiar with a woman whose story didn't seem that, like, it didn't seem that crazy. Like, she was under arrest and it was like, a, it was like a miss, it was a misunderstanding. And ultimately she got out of it. Um, but they tried to make it right. scarier than it was. No, no, that was a different okay. one. That one was okay. one uh, from, I think, somebody who was in Canada. And a, a lot of what she wrote about seemed uh, yeah, a lot more realistic. Um, like, it's unrealistic you know, and, un and very unpleasant and like extremely inconvenient, yes. but it wasn't like rape and torture. And OK, so yeah, I'm mixing no, it up. I, that was else. that was a story I looked at and I said that that might be possible. That might have actually yeah. happened. And it's a terrible situation and it shouldn't happen. But it it, it still wouldn't be enough to start sanctioning Xinjiang and to really attack China with. You need stories like Tursne Ziwad and this other person's. But mm -hmm. what, what I was saying was when you realize there was a big hole in her story, that her passport was renewed while she was in these concentration camps, apparently. Um, a, 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 BBC ran it and you could see the issues with the story. And then CNN, when it got to CNN, who aired it afterwards, they blurred out her passport renewal date, which means, which I'm assuming. I remember. They okay. Know, I remember this. Yeah. 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 They know that it's a massive hole in their story, but they still want to push they it. Don't they care. don't want to address this. The BBC reached out to me because they wanted to do a hit piece on me. And I said, I'll engage with you. I'll engage with all of your questions. But can you tell me why you publish, publish this story uncritically when there's all these holes in it? You, you answer me that question. I'll answer all of your questions. They refused to answer it. There was a there was a a, a, um, a survey, or not a survey, a, a petition on change.org with 4,000 signatures, people asking the same question of the BBC. Why are you doing this? Because people saw that this was pro-war, completely fake propaganda. They refused to answer it. And in the end, the BBC dropped me from their article. They didn't even want to engage with me anymore. They're like, this guy's, <laughs> this guy's dangerous. Now, I'm, I don't like this. <laughs> you know, this guy. So, so, so um, you know, Going back to your time in Xinjiang, a lot of what we often hear, and you explained the the side of it of like, okay, these the Salafi jihadist weaker group, which by the way, I should let people know. I mean, I actually have talked to their victims in Syria. I've t I've talked. They actually played a massive role. The the Turkestan Islamic Party, that is the weaker separatist group, that the U.S. delisted. They played a major role in acting as shock troops for Al Qaeda when they took over Idlib, and they actually took over the entire town uh, in Idlib called Jisr al Uh, And I met people who are from there, and they're really angry because they not only can they no longer return to their homes, uh, their homes are now occupied by Uyghurs from China. I mean, All right. it's like if yeah. you want to talk about people wiping out local culture, I mean, there you have it. Um, Anyways, so the, you know, the, the narrative we also hear is that, of course, Xinjiang isn't all Uyghurs. You mentioned Mongols are there and other, I think there's some other groups. There's also a significant number of Han Chinese who are there. And in U.S. media and from people like Adrian Zenz, who we can talk about as well, uh, the narrative is that the Han Chinese are supremacists and they're very racist towards the Uyghur. Uyghurs and they're being moved in to like replace them in Xinjiang. So my question for you is, is there diversity in Xinjiang? Um, is And did you notice any sort of attempt to impose one culture on people? And actually, I would I would extend that question to all of China, because we hear that across China, diversity is like very frowned upon and everybody needs to just, you know, absorb Han Chinese culture. So what expressions of also, you know, Muslim or other minority cultures are visible even beyond Xinjiang in China? 
Yeah, I mean, you've got the Hui Muslims in China. And before China really became a geopolitical target, you could see really honest pieces being written about China where um, I can't remember the uh, the outlet, but they were writing about how progressive Islam is in China, that they have these all women mosques with female imams. They have a history with this that goes beyond any other even like full on Muslim country. Um you know, it, it's really celebrated here. There was a uh, so in terms of mixing and stuff like that, a lot of the Han Chinese were moving into northern areas of um, of Xinjiang, like areas that weren't really heavily populate, populated by Uyghurs. And I spoke to some of them actually uh, two months ago or something. I had a taxi driver who was from Xinjiang. He was a Han Chinese. He was born in Xinjiang. Um, I can't remember the, the 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 town name, but it's because his parents were moved there by the government. They were workers who went to do this really, really hard labor in Xinjiang, build it up. But the interesting thing was they weren't given any land. They weren't given any mm. kind of agricultural land or things like that, where the Uyghurs, this is their local land. They have their own land in the south, especially they're growing a lot of their own cotton, which is a really important thing to note as well. So many Uyghurs in the south own their own plot of land where they grow cotton. They rely on it for their source of income. So when the U.S. starts sanctioning cotton without any real evidence of this forced labor uh, thing, when you look through the forced labor reports and you, you actually examine it, they're ridiculous. They know exactly what they're doing. Sanctions, as you know, with how they work, they're designed to push people into poverty, push people into situations where they're discontent and they rise up against their own government. There's an additional element in Xinjiang where uh, it's been proven over and over, go over with uh, different studies. The World Bank did a study on this as well. In an environment of poverty and unemployment, it's a breeding ground for extremism. It's a very conducive to um, uh, to kind of breed uh, extremists. So you can you you add that together with the fact that the U.S. delisted ETIM as a terrorist organization, gave them their blessings. Then they try to do all of these sanctions on, on Xinjiang because they know that one of the biggest successes in Xinjiang to eliminating this extremism was opportunities, infrastructure, jobs, skills, trainings, all, all this kind of stuff. So how do you take that away? OK, let's sanction them. Let's sanction their mm -hmm. their cotton. OK, now let's sanction their high tech industry, the uh, um, the solar panels. Oh, let's say we received uh what was it, 30 tons of human hair or something like that. There was a shipment that went into the U.S. There was no follow-up because they, they were, it, was, it was apparently synthetic hair, but they said, no, it might be real hair. There was no follow-up on whether they tested it. But when you really looked at the claims by Radio Free Asia and stuff like that, and you looked at how many tons of hair was being shipped or and how much money was being generated by hair from Uyghur women, it doesn't even add up when you look at the Uyghur population. Unless when you go to Xinjiang, there's going to be bald Uyghur women everywhere. And I didn't see a single bald Uyghur woman, you know, it's just these ridiculous stories. But the um, the whole premise is to uh, sanction um, uh, Xinjiang, take these opportunities away and bring this uh, extremism back. But the local culture is really being to answer the other part of your question is really being practiced there. And one thing you just have to look at is with all of these narratives about inner Mongolia, the Mongolian culture being taken away or all these different places in China, these sub communities oftentimes more often than not, their local culture is preserved even better than it is back in their home country. In Mongolia, mm. in, in inner Mongolia, they're still using the original Mongolian script. They're not even using that in Mongolia anymore. If you talk mm. about uh, Kyrgyz, uh, Kyrgyz people, when they go to Ky uh, Kyrgyzstan, the people in Kyrgyzstan, all the young people there, they don't even know how to speak their own language anymore. They only speak Russian. But in China, they're still speaking their local language. You have all these pockets of people who their culture has been preserved in China even more than it has in their original ancestral homes. And that by itself should really tell people something. I'm curious if when you were in Xinjiang, did you see any um, evidence of the impact of sanctions? Um, or is China, it seems like China has so far managed to uh, not be so affected by them because of local consumption. Um, but I don't know. I also see stories about some Uyghurs saying, you know, they've lost their jobs because, you know, their factory can't afford them anymore because they lost international buyers for their cotton. I'm not, you know, I'm hearing mixed things. Um, you know, I think that a lot of exports are still happening to Europe. Um, I, th I think it's still doing pretty well. Some companies, you know, if they had specific business or their primary business was the U with the U.S., I would imagine that those companies would suffer more than others. But th there's another trickle on effect. A lot of Uyghurs who work in the rest of China, in Western companies also, you know, contractors to Apple and all these people, 
a lot of these companies have, have come out with a new policy where they're not going to hire Uyghur workers anymore. And the reason really? is, yeah, yeah. And the reason is, is because they can't afford the possible accusations they're going to have when somebody takes a video in their factory and they see there's a Uyghur worker there because without any threshold for evidence, without any proof, they're going to say that, oh, look, they have a forced laborer here who was probably transferred from Xinjiang. So they're losing their job opportunities in a lot of these Western yes. uh, uh, companies. It's doing exactly what the U.S. wants. They want to they don't want to help the Uyghurs. They want to take away opportunities from them and they want to create an environment where there'll be unrest in China. You know, we look at the bigger picture that we I guess we've got to zoom out. And, you know, why does the U.S. want to do this? Like you said, they're going to overtake the U.S. economically. Countries in the global south all of a sudden don't have a single monopolistic partner to deal with who's very brutal with the way that they deal with them. They have another choice now, a country that doesn't interfere with their local politics. You know, you um, you have the digital renminbi coming because the U.S. has weaponized the U.S. dollar for so long that they've created an incentive for an alternative. And China might be filling that alternative. You don't mess around with U.S. dollar hegemony. If you want to, you know, to use the right. famous phrase, Google Uyghurs, if you want to see what happens when you challenge the U.S. dollar, Google Gaddafi, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so I want to go to the issue of so. So basically what, what you're saying is what we're hearing in the U.S. is genocide and mass sterilization and mass rape and this attempt to destroy Uyghur culture is actually a de-radicalization program, which certainly might have as missteps, but it's being totally... Right blown out of proportion and sensationalized and lied about and who like who's behind these claims because I you know there's one figure I a lot of listeners and viewers have probably heard of Adrian Zenz he's the German far-right sort of Christian fanatic who works with the victims of communism fund victims of communism which by the way now considers every COVID death in the world a victim of <laughs> communism um, and Nazis, so that's not, Nazi deaths and, at the hands of the Nazi Soviets deaths. are also yes. victims of uh, communism. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Nazi deaths are victims of communism. Um, so that tells you as much as you need to know about that organization. So we know about Adrian Zenz. There's also seems to be this network of of U.S. mostly U.S. funded, although Australian as well, Uyghur organizations um, right. of sort of like Uyghur exiles, which are pushing these claims and lobbying governments and receiving funding from the State Department. Uh, and things like this. Why are they doing this? Like what ultimately we know, but I'd love to hear you break it down because you've explained, I've heard you explain it really well. Why, why are we hearing these outrageous claims when they're not true? What, 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 so there's so many different layers here. So with the U.S. state sponsored kind of narrative, they're p pumping millions of dollars into this narrative, which by the way, any time we, we know already, everybody knows the U.S. lies for geopolitical reasons. They create false flag attacks. They deploy fake, wit wit fake witness testimonies. They lie about uh, atrocities that, while covering up their own atrocities. They lie about weapons of mass destruction. They uh, And not, not by mistake, they literally tell you the opposite of what intelligence reports are saying. We know this over and over again. So the moment that something is funded, that there's a narrative that's funded by the U.S. government, even if it's only $1, even if it's only $1, you should immediately <laughs> be skeptical you don't have to completely right. disregard it, but at least have your guard up and look into the claims. So the U.S.'s interest is obviously to, to discredit um, China, uh, to prevent them from being able to grow their partnerships in a meaningful way. You saw when Pompeo was flying around the world asking people not to use Huawei systems because maybe they'll use it to spy on them, just like the U.S. uses their equipment to spy on Angela Merkel and all this stuff. They're saying that maybe China will do the stuff that we do to you. Um, you know, so it's about discrediting China, derailing their progress, trying to slow them down. Um, and uh, so that would be that part. Now, uh, the think tanks in Australia, like uh, Aspie, for example, they're funded, yes, by the U.S. State Department, but they're also funded by weapons manufacturers like mm -hmm. Boeing and Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, all these people. And so what they do is they create China threat stories. They also say, wow, Chinese missiles can reach Australia now, which they can and all this different kind of stuff. And then what they end up doing is they then sell weapons to the Australian government, China threat prevention weapons on the backs of the China threat stories that they just finished manufacturing. So there's a lot of money being passed around with this. I mean, look in, look, look in Iraq, you know, um, when, uh, uh, you know, who, who, what was that? A hundred billion dollars uh, were passed around to security contractors. Um, you know, one of the biggest winners, Halliburton which was Dick Cheney's, mm -hmm. you know, ex company that he was the CEO of. There's a lot of money that get pa gets passed around. There was a winner in Afghanistan. It was also the weapons manufacturers. Look at what happened to their stock prices since 2001. So there's that incentive as well. But then the other piece is that a lot of this propaganda, like the forced sterilizations, the labor camps and all this stuff, it's 
recycled jihadist propaganda. This is actually one of the reasons so many Muslim countries side with China. You always hear about 20 some odd countries in the UN who condemned China's treatment of Muslims in Xinjiang, but you never hear about the media talking about the 54 other countries that said, no, they actually approve of what they're doing. They think they're doing a good job. This is something that, you know, they're, uh, they're uh, 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 adhering to human rights and everything like that when they do this. And many of them were Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. And again, those Muslims who reach out to me, I talk to them and I, I try to understand why is it they support this? So one is what I already explained to you. They understand the threat of this kind of uh, uh, Salafist jihadism ideology. But the other thing, too, is, is they've seen this propaganda before used over and over again. They used it in Egypt right. as well. They were saying that the Christians were sterilizing the Muslims. And to this day in universities, Christians can't, it was either teach or, or learn uh, obstetrics in universities. Really? To this day I didn't even know that. Because, wow. because of those rumors have persisted. And it was a, a group that wanted to separate a piece of land off, of, uh, off from Egypt also. They were talking about the destruction of mosques. Everything was identical. And so when they see this propaganda against China, they're like, we, we've seen this before. The only difference this time is Western media is helping these jihadists pop, uh, prop this up, which is also a rallying call, which is also used for their um, for getting other people on board for recruitment um, uh, to, to join this cause. So there's a there's a whole bunch of different angles at play here as to what are the uh, possible uh, motives behind uh, pushing this propaganda. And then there is also the Belt and Road Initiative, which is another layer, right? Um, and if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Xinjiang is a, a important part of this uh, Belt and Road, Road Initiative in terms of infrastructure. No. Oh yeah, it's a key doorway, of course. Yeah, I mean that, that that leads through to a lot of the countries that these infrastructure projects are going through. It's extremely important for the Belt and Road Initiative, which again ties into their partnerships with the Global South, which and when we're we're talking about countries that for over a century have been remarkably remarkably been able to supply the west with the most precious materials on our earth while having the poorest people on our planet you know something isn't right That's there. imperialism so now, yeah yeah so, <laughs> so now all of a sudden you have a partner that comes in they're willing to come with a bit more of a win-win situation. Now, that's being propagandized also. One of the biggest myths is the Sri Lanka port. And I, I won't get mm -hmm. into that into detail, but you can look up how all of these things are myths about not creating local not jobs, not actually benefiting the local economy. No, it, it's actually having benefit. That's why the propaganda is going to overdrive. And that's why you all of a sudden saw a mad rush from European countries to suddenly apologize for their colonial era crimes <laughs> like, they're, like they're in a you know, it's, it's all, honestly it looks like they're an ex abusive partner saying, no, please don't leave. Just give me one more chance. You know, <laughs> that's it's true. Germany recently apologized to like Namibia, but then they were like, we yeah. won't give you reparations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. France. yeah. So, no, we're just really sorry. Can you please? Yeah. yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry. Um, so, after like so we're, this, we're this all, is, yeah. Yeah. So th Go this ahead. is, I mean, uh, there are so many corporations western corporations that benefit from a monop from having monopolistic power over these countries and they're going yeah. to be losing that soon they're going to be losing that um and and that's uh and and the the US military has been deployed over and over again to protect corporate interests whether it be uh, you know british petroleum and iran whether it be all the way from the beginning of uh, america's history when they were going out and scraping guano off of the islands in the south pacific uh, for fertilizer for their country you know america was built on this and their military was protecting these corporations so i think that's what you see there's a lot of corporate there's a lot of corporate interests at risk here um so belt and road is an important part of that network that's going to help uh, China cooperate with these countries that were exploited so long by the uh, by the West. And also, I just I, I should note the U.S. Uh, budget office. I might be wrong. I think it's like the budget office actually like declared a crazy amount of money, like hundreds of millions of dollars, literally just to propagandize against the Belt and Road right. Initiative. Of course, they yeah, put it in different language than that. Go ahead. Yeah, it was 200 or 300 million dollars per year for a period of seven years in propaganda <laughs> against China. I mean, imagine if they put that into like infrastructure or actually yeah. competing instead. You know, when, when China goes into these countries and they go, go into these African countries, there's a few things that people need to keep in mind. If China's options are so brutal and so exploitative and debt trap diplomacy and all this kind of stuff, how much worse do your options need to be that they're choosing China over you? Mm -hmm. And instead of investing in propaganda, why don't you just come to the table with better options? 
You know, the, uh, when 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 China goes into the global south and I see all these countries that have been exploited for so long, I don't I don't hope that China takes over the world or becomes the number one superpower. You know, whether that happens or not, that's not what, what I was hoping would happen is it would create an environment of accountability where there's an a, there's, first of all, a chance to improve. And then mm -hmm. second, there's a chance for two different powers or multiple powers to compete for business in the global south on more fair terms. And you're seeing that already in in uh, Central America as well, where, you know, Central American countries are uh, going to China, even some of them, you know, even some of the people in the government who think it is a debt, debt trap diplomacy, they're saying, you know, at the end of the day, we need this infrastructure, we we don't we don't have the expertise to build it ourselves. And we know that China is not going to come in and assassinate our leaders, they're not going to come in and yeah. overthrow our government. They don't, you know, because China, I mean, the big, big difference that I often hear from people around the world in the in, in third world countries is that, you know, China will literally work with any country, regardless of how its system functions. It's not in whereas the U.S. is like, no, you have to meet these conditions. You have to be a neoliberal economy. And if you're not, you have to neoliberalize. You have to privatize everything. And then maybe we'll consider doing business with you. But even then, they don't build anything. And then on top of not building anything in other countries and putting all this money into anti-China propaganda they actually bully governments uh, uh, to to force them like not to go into business with china for example right. like lebanon where i live and where i am right now is in desperate need of investment in its infrastructure and it has a collapsing economy it can't do anything on its own right now i mean the government uh, the country is in complete free fall it's a disaster uh and i told you we talked a little bit about it before because i told you i have electricity cuts that i had to schedule right. this interview around and china actually months ago when trump was still in office uh, had offered to work on some infrastructure, potential investment in infrastructure, and the U.S. Have prevented it. The U.S. got, but they're, but they're also not doing anything as an alternative. So they just right. bully these weak governments. And I think the other thing about China that is uh, a threat on um on more of an in, in more of an abstract way is the fact that China was for so long this very poor country that has alleviated so much poverty or all extreme poverty, if I'm not mistaken. And it, and it did it without being a ne without the neoliberal capitalist model. Um, and just as an example, it's a threat because that's what other countries look at. Other countries right. in Africa and the Middle East, they see that as something really positive that they want to emulate. And of course, that's a huge challenge to the hegemony of U.S. monopoly capital but um, or U.S. finance capital. But I wanted to ask you, about the criticisms you've received, because um, you know people mostly from these anti-China organizations, some of which you mentioned, have actually like written about you. It's, it's kind of amazing. Oh, yeah. You should feel flattered. The amount of <laughs> the Al amount of want a piece on me too. Yeah, did they? Congratulations! Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> so you should feel flattered because what that means is that you're you're an effective per your what your narrative and what you're saying is effective and it's actually informing people. Uh, against you know this this all of this propaganda, but I've seen a lot of this stuff written about you, and of course the, some of the things they'll say is you know they'll say oh you have this big social media following on platforms that are banned in China, and the only way you could do that is if the CCP like was was allowing you to because they're funding you um, and that you're just a stooge. So I wanted to give you an opportunity because I'm sure at least one person will comment right. on this video and be like, oh, he's a stooge of the CCP. Oh, yeah. Like, how, do you <laughs> how do you respond to those criticisms? You know what? You, you, so I usually have uh, I usually don't address them. But what I find is and I'll go into a more uh, detailed answer. But what, what I want to say to those people is assume all those things are true fine Ass assume that's true if you think that that's why i'm doing this if you think that i'm i'm really funded by the the chinese government and i'm doing this as some sort of a grift it should be so much easier to address my arguments my arguments would be superficial so why can't you actually engage with them like tell me wh where right. where you think i'm lying it, it, it come up with a rebuttal i said the same thing to some of these other journalists that reached out to me because when these journalists when they reach out to anti-china people they ask them meaningful questions about, well, how did you come to this conclusion? What's your thought process behind this? Then they contact pro-China people and they're like, how does it feel to be a, you know, a, a, a tool of the, the Chinese Communist Party? It's like, really? Right. Like, 
you've gotten the mainstream media has gotten the narrative wrong on geopolitics so many times. You're, a lot of people are losing trust in these outlets. Don't you think it's a bit it's about time you start engaging both sides of an argument in an equally honest way? But no, I mean, I'm not I, I do this all on my own. This actually takes away from my business, my mm -hmm. my main business. So I, I have a brew pub here. I, I, I brew beer and I also do some trading and investing and stuff like that. And a lot of people say that, oh, that's that's why I do it. Like, I, I have a local brew pub. Do you think I'm going to sell my beer internationally <laughs> from my online fame or something like that? If you want my beer, you've got you've to come to Shenzhen in the location and drink my beer. You really think I'm going to be benefiting from this? Or do you think I can only operate a bar here with, with a Chinese Communist Party permission also? And everybody, every foreigner who owns a bar in China, and many there are, are some sort of uh, uh, CCP shill as well. I mean, the argument doesn't make sense. Um, it was annoying at first because actually I put a lot of money, uh, my own money into this. I don't I don't make anything from this. Most of my videos recently, I even turned the uh, uh, I even monetization turned the, off. I, I turned the monetization off in part because I'm like, I, that's not my main source of income to begin with. Right. I'm doing this because I'm passionate about speaking up and also because the U.S. started charging taxes on uh, uh, on uh, overseas uh, content creators. If your ads are played to Americans <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to pay really? taxes to the U.S. government. So I'm like, oh. Okay, I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a, a Patreon. Wait, account. but you're not. You're not even American. See, they they charge everybody. So like you, you, YouTube, YouTube came out with a new thing where any of your ads that are played to U.S. viewers are going to be taxed. Uh, uh they're going to be taxed because yeah, y yeah. Yeah, we can't. We can't weird. tax billionaires of an America, but we'll tax content <laughs> yeah, creators like who are American. Oh yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, so, okay. Um, yeah, but but I don't. I would I would like to to make this bigger and I'm really cautious about it. Like if I ever did a Patreon or something like that, it would be solely to build a team around this. This is me, one person. I don't have any help whatsoever. That's impressive um, too. It's quite you're quite good at it. Like uh, I know you, you know the video, the the effort that goes into editing a video and actually like inserting clips and writing scripts and doing segments is a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of work, and it takes away yeah. from my time that I could be spending on something else. So this is I, I spend money on this. I'm putting money and time into this, um, because at the end of the day, I'm just I'm I'm really angry at how this global narrative works. Uh, you know, the, the, like I said, the U.S. destroyed my mother's country back then as well, and he, they keep destroying country af over country after country mm -hmm. after country. And I think people should speak up, and. It, the unfortunate thing is, is there's so many mechanisms in place to shut people up as well. And this is where I want to get into where I said I, I appreciate what you do, because it, the, the mechanisms in place create an interesting situation. So I speak up about Xinjiang and what I'm called is I'm called a genocide denier because I'm just mm -hmm. giving, you know, giving out facts. I'm telling people what I see on the ground now. When I see other lies being perpetuated elsewhere, when I see things that I'm suspicious about, for example, in Syria, if I start saying, well, hold on a second, and I start like asking questions about the Syrian narrative, now I'll be called uh, an Assad apologist. I think that's what they, people go with, you know? And it's like, I've already got this stigma to shake. People are calling me, I, that's the last <laughs> thing I need to deal with, you know? <laughs> so so it, creates, it creates these bubbles where you stay in your lane. And it's you're self-censor. Like, you self-censor. You end yeah. up self-censoring, yeah. I live in China. This is what I'm going to talk about. But then when you see this other stuff, you, I think you got to break out and not be afraid of that criticism. When I see what's happening in Syria, when I see, and there's a crossover too, because there's Uyghurs there as well. And when you see these moderate rebels who are driving around in pickup trucks with cages on the back, with nuns in them, and they were driving around with them to uh, disincentive Assad from doing an airstrike on them. It's like, well, hold on a second. I thought I thought Assad just airstrikes everyone and he doesn't care. He's this brutal person. So these <laughs> terrorists know that that's an incentive to not air airstrike them. Or when in Germany, they block people from going to vote in the election. It's like, well, hold on a second. What's going on here? And then you have to go to like a Russian uh, station to see that, oh, there were actually people protesting outside of the uh, Syrian consulate in Germany who are pro Assad. I thought they were escaping Assad. Oh, it turns out they left Idlib and they were running away from America's moderate rebels and right. all these things where um, I think people need to cross over a little bit and say, 
there's so many things that you're lied about all you're that they're lying about all the time. So that's why what I appreciate about you. You cover you. Syria, you cover <laughs> all of these areas, but you're willing to go across and say, you know what, something smells fishy about this Xinjiang narrative, and I'm going to talk about it. I know I'm going to be called a genocide denier, and now I'm just going to be an all round like you know, fetus, Daniel. You know, I'll, but I'll be honest with you. Like I, I totally know exactly what you're talking about as well because you know I was obviously very outspoken on Syria, and I got called everything. I think I, I even lost jobs over it, and Syria is something that impacted me very personally. I have family in Syria. Um, and they were not, they were not thrilled about America's moderate rebels. Um, but the point is, is, you know, I actually will admit like for a little while I stayed away the Xinjiang narrative because I'm like, I already yeah. have to be called an Assadist every day of my life. Like I just don't want to have to be called this too, but yeah, it's, you know, even it, it actually does have an impact, this name calling and this sort of reputational, character assassination uh has an absolute impact and i think you know i'm I've, I've been a big fan of yours as well it's very the feeling is mutual and i think you're in a really cool position because you don't have to worry about that so much like right. it's like you're not in the world of like having to depend on a u.s media outlets to to you know for your livelihood so I, you know and that's another thing that's probably really aggravating for those who attack you is they don't have an employer they can call to be like, to be like, we don't want this guy to be employed anymore. He's a genocide denier. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that would happen. If I was in the West, I would not be speaking up. I, if I, I needed to have a regular right. job in the West, I would not speak up. And it's really ironic. People say that, oh, I can only be pro-China because I'm in China. I can't say bad things about the government. I have criticized the government before. Actually, even it was published in Chinese state media as well. But they say, well, overall, you need to have a positive position because you're in China. Well, no, those people who are criticizing me, they need to be criticizing me. They need to be on that side of the narrative if they, they want to stay employable in the West. So they're, it's the exact same problem for them. As soon as if, 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 if BBC did that hit piece on me or Al Jazeera did that hit piece on me um, and I did a response video on it and I'm working a regular corporate job in the West and my boss comes to me and says, Daniel, why, why is Al Jazeera calling you a shill for the Chinese Communist Party? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think this is going to work out anymore. You know, you know I would be, I, I would not, I would not speak up. And I know so many people, and this is where a lot of people uh, regularly chat with me. They give me their ideas. They, they send me things that they've noticed. Um, and they would really like to speak up also, but they live in the West. They live in Australia. They right. live in America. They live yeah. in Canada. They can't speak up. They can't fight back against this narrative without consequences for themselves. And that's ironic. And they're, they're saying that I'm the one who's living in this society where I don't have free speech or I'm only saying this because I have to say it. Like the, the, have some reflection, people, you know? Yeah, a lot of it ends up being just this like projection, 100%. Um, you know, I wanted to very briefly, because I know like I've had you for a very long time and you probably have a lot of other things you need to go get to. But since I do have you on and you do live in China, I was curious to ask you about the issue of poverty alleviation. Um, mm -hmm. And like, you know, you've lived in, I don't know how much time you've spent in the US because Canada doesn't really have the same level of, sort of in your face, uh, homelessness and poverty that even nice, gorgeous US cities have. Um, but like in China, do you see the sort of poverty that you see in the West? Do you see, cause we do hear that China's eliminated extreme poverty. And I think that's really amazing. And rather than demonizing China, I feel like we should be asking how did they do that? And what can we do to emulate some of those, you know, clearly successful programs, but is homelessness a problem? Cause every time I go back to the US, I feel like I'm walking over homeless people. Yeah, I mean, the, when I first came to China in 2008, you would definitely see homeless people more often. You'd see uh, not not it's not like it's a major issue even back then. Like you'd see one or two in the downtown area or something like that um, or beggars or something like that. You really don't see that anymore. You might still see some people who, ju who just do that to, to make some extra cash or something like that. But I, I honestly can't remember the last time I saw somebody on the street. Uh, maybe uh, I mean honestly it must be like four years ago five years ago or something wow. like that um uh yeah i mean if they are out there i don't know where they are but you can see a continual improvement in life now a lot of people always point to the fact that they say oh well the threshold is like two dollars a day or something like that but people have to understand as part of the poverty alleviation efforts home ownership or people who have a, a plot of land in their village is very high here they're people who live on their own land they're self-sustained they have all kinds of other social benefits that come along with just you know, uh, you know uh, different kinds of healthcare and all this uh, stuff, they can live comfortably on 
the amounts that they set. And in many ways, the threshold is much higher compared to other places when you take all of that into consideration. Um, you know, I know, yeah, I know a guy in my, in my wife's village, he's just, you know, a lazy guy who didn't really do anything and he's taken care of as well. He's got a little house he should in, the, be, yeah. in the village. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it, it's, uh, and then when you hear stories from, you know, my wife's generation growing up, the continual improvement in life, like back then they had absolutely nothing. Um, people are really, uh, you know, I mean, it's really impressive what they've done here. So the poverty alleviation, alleviation efforts, absolutely. I mean, they're they're 100 percent real. Um, I think there's probably still a lot more work to be done. But you're right. The West should be looking at, OK, well, what is it exactly that's done? It's not just about giving people a handout or giving people money like these teams went into these villages and they taught them how to do all these things. They taught them how to repair their house if they have livestock and they're one of, you know, one of their, their cows are sick or something like that. What do you do? It's not it's about creating a self-sufficient society. Um, it was, it, it was an amazing program. I mean, PBS and uh, CGTN had a documentary that came out on poverty alleviation and it was a beautiful documentary. You can still find it online, but before it was going to air in the U S PBS pulled it because there was backlash. Really? Saying, we can't show that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. And, and, yeah. So CGTN ended up re releasing it on their own, but it's just <laughs> the poverty alleviation efforts. What happened? What, what how did these community workers go in and what do they do for these communities? I mean, it would be amazing for the West to learn from this stuff, but man, that would really make them look bad. You know, when they're spending, <laughs> yeah. you know, $200 million per year to demonize China, a country that's lifting their people out of poverty while their people are sitting on the streets and they're designing these uh, garbage cans that are going to cost $20,000 each to put on the street so that people can't take stuff out of the garbage. You know, I don't know if you saw that. They were thinking of making these, gar <laughs> these garbage cans so that people couldn't scavenge from the garbage cans. Like, how much wealth Jesus. can you recycle from a garbage can over the period of the life of the garbage can? Maybe like two, oh, three hundred dollars wow. worth. So you're going to spend twenty thousand dollars to make sure That's that crazy. no discarded wealth is recycled before you know. <laughs> I, oh I mean, man, it's, the it's, U.S. is such a U.S. is such a brutally like harsh capitalist environment that of course any 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 successful poverty alleviation program would be a huge threat to that. And then just real quick on the issue of Xinjiang and the relationship with poverty alleviation, a lot of these things that we hear about, it's amazing to me how a lot of these programs that actually sound like good things are then portrayed as monstrous. Like the issue of sterilization, if that actually comes from making birth control more accessible to Uyghurs, like isn't that a right. good thing? Like, you gotta, you gotta, I thought, yeah, I thought you gotta, we support gotta, access to birth control. It's like a progressive thing to do. There was a uh, there's a professor from uh, Japanese University, uh, Stuart Gilmore, I think it is. He's a a, a, a bio sta a stat statistician. Uh, I can't even say word right now, but he's basically a scientist <laughs> of this kind of information, what, what, whatever, however you say it. Um, and he laid into these uh, uh, groups like Adrian Zentz and Aspie who put these reports out saying this doesn't even make sense. How are you making these conclusions? And he put graphs and charts and said, then that means there's a genocide going on in Japan. Also, there's a genocide going on here. There's, you know, I mean, uh, when you actually, like I said, when you look at the underlying reports, they mistranslate things. They just make these crazy stretches like they try to say that, OK, Uyghurs are in a position that's vulnerable to being exploited labor. And they say that a lot of Uyghurs can't speak Mandarin Chinese, so they're very vulnerable. Then later on in the report, they they, they criticize the Chinese government for teaching Uyghurs to speak yeah. Mandarin Chinese. It's like, well, what, what do you, which one do you want? And you see that they're doing these twists and turns and stretches to make a report that excuses then the policies that come down to sanction Xinjiang, push them back into poverty, and hopefully restore terrorism to the region. Um, it's you know uh, so yeah Adrian Zanz, there's also uh, there's also me. the there's also the issue of like uh the China's I guess now has a two child policy is it two child like two but uh, that, the, right then the one child but even the one child policy never actually had to apl never applied to that's, that's, uh certain minority that's groups. Right. That's right. So before before now, it's a little bit more even. Everybody's kind of on an even playing field. But for the longest time, uh, ethnic minorities weren't subject to the one child policy. And you got to keep in mind also is that in any society that improves, uh, you know, birth rates naturally go down. And so you take into context that China just fit, it completed one of the most epic poverty alleviation programs in our Earth's entire history. 
-hmm. you're naturally going to see birth rates going down. Now, when you see birth rates going down more for ethnic minorities than Han Chinese, a lot of these ethnic minority groups, especially in the outside areas, they were having seven, eight, nine, sometimes 10 kids. So there's not much room for the birth rate for Han Chinese to go down because they were, they were already restricted to one child. But all of a sudden, these Uyghur communities that are now going into the workplace, they have, uh, uh, you know, women are uh, there. Were, I heard stories of a lot of women also being liberated by the fact that they had more kind of power in their family, whereas before only their husband was working. There was no if they if they were in an abusive relationship, they were it was a very difficult situation for them to, to leave. Um, so it, 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 it empowered uh, Uyghur women. And when you have that kind of a situation, you're going to see a bigger drop from those communities as well. So all of this context is taken out. Um, mm -hmm. They do these twists and turns. They say that, um, what is it, labor placement programs, uh, basically headhunters. They said, oh, those are uh, for, uh, I can't remember exactly how they worded it. Like it's forced I'm surprised labor they didn't or call like them that. pimps or something. Like I, uh, it's yeah. just. <laughs> but, but, but what they described as forced labor, a agents of forced labor would mean that every headhunter in the West is also, you know, procuring forced labor as well. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the reports don't make sense. They don't need to make sense because most people won't look at them. And right. even the mainstream media outlets will then publish their headlines based on that. Yeah. And you've got all these layers of disinformation. Now with the forced labor, you had a lot of companies kick back, you know, fight back. You know, you had Skechers um, who went and did an independent, unannounced visit to the factory that was implicated that they use. And they did an, a complete audit and they found no evidence. And they did multiple visits, no evidence to support it. Um, uh, there were a few other companies also. Uh, Astrel, also a Hong Kong firm, actually sued. Um, and they've been taken off of the list. Like there's nothing there to back up their their claims. Um and, and uh, but yeah, the force forced labor is going to continue to be a really important part of this because, again, you know, just as I mean, a Abby Martin was the person on, you know, Empire Files who did a really good piece on sanctions talking about that's what sanctions are designed to do yeah. is to put yeah. people into poverty and have them rise up against their government. Um, there's somebody working with the um, with the Biden administration. I can't remember his name, but he Richard wrote Nephew. a book on. Richard yeah, that's Nephew. right. Uh, yeah. When he described the sanctions on Iran. He's like, that's what he's talking about, creating these situations of unemployment, make them a little bit more sticky, as he was calling them. <laughs> they, they, know, they know exactly what they're doing. It's not about uplifting people or caring oh, no. about human rights. Yeah, uh, I, I'm watching the re reality of sanctions and their impact around me. And one of them is you know, having no fuel. Uh, and when you take fuel away from a society, it's like incredible that anybody in their air conditioned offices in D.C., like lies to themselves and says that they're helping people because you're just making people completely miserable. Um, right. But on that note, Daniel, where can people find your work? Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on YouTube, just uh, Daniel Dumbrill um, and on Twitter under the same name. That's, uh, that's all I have right now, really. Well, thank you so much for joining us and breaking this all down for us. Thanks very much for having me.